Welcome back and congratulations on almost making it through the course. So this is our last actual lecture. Next class period will go through homework four and then the one after that will be an open review. And today we're gonna to talk about exchange rate regimes and currency crises and how those fit into a lot of what we've talked about so far with domestic macro. So to start off with, I'm gonna introduce three different types of what I'm gonna call an exchange rate regime. And an exchange rate regime is a way that a country organizes its currency with respect to the exchange rate of other countries. And there are three basic ways that this can be done. First of all, a floating exchange rate is gonna be where the country has a currency and it doesn't really do anything in particular to worry about the exchange rate. It's just gonna basically leave that aside and worry about other things. The second type of regime is gonna be called a crawling peg. And a crawling peg is going to be a currency where the government doesn't worry too much about exchange rate movements, but if things get too out of whack, then it'll step in and try to smooth out some major fluctuations. And finally, the third type of exchange rate regime is going to be what we're gonna call a fixed exchange rate. And in a fixed exchange rate regime, the government is going to basically care only about the exchange rate to the exclusion of a lot of other things. Now you can divide this more finely. There's kind of a spectrum between fixed and floating with crawling pegs in the middle. And so something can be either more pegged or less pegged depending on how much importance the government places on the exchange rate as opposed to other factors. But we're gonna mainly talk about these three in broad strokes. And this is actually kind of an old table here. You'll notice that uh, China is located in other fixed pegs. China since moved down and become more of a crawling peg. And you can see a few others here have had currency crises since then and they've moved from fixed to floating. So we'll start with fixed exchange rates. Fixed exchange rates should be pretty familiar to you because the way that fixed exchange rates work is gonna be exactly the way that private banks work with respect to base money. So in the case of a fixed exchange rate, the central bank is going to make its money a promise to pay something in terms of a foreign currency. So essentially what it does is it says, we're gonna stand willing to buy any amount of domestic currency for a fixed amount of foreign currency. So if you go to the central bank and say, hey, I've got a thousand Hong Kong dollars, I would like US dollars. The central bank's gonna give that to you at a fixed rate. By the same token, if you have US dollars and you say, I want Hong Kong dollars, they'll give you as many as you want as long as you're willing to pay that fixed rate. And you'll notice that this is exactly the same thing that banks do with bank deposits. Right? You can go to the bank and give them any amount of cash and they'll give you bank deposits in exchange. Or you can go to the bank and if you have an account with them, if you have deposits, you can ask for those back at a fixed rate of $1 worth of deposits for $1 worth of cash. So you can think of private banks as pegging a currency at a one-to-one -one rate. Whereas for fixed exchange rate regimes across countries, that rate may or may not be one-to-one. -one. In fact, it's usually not one-to-one. -one. But the mechanics of it are exactly the same. So the central bank here is constrained in a lot of the same ways that private banks are constrained in our economy. Right, so we've gone over before how private banks are not able to determine the quantity of money they issue. That that's gonna be determined by the quantity of promises, the quantity of M0, as well as the demand to hold that bank's promises. The exact same thing is gonna be true of central bank issues where there's a fixed exchange rate. Right, that's gonna be determined by the quantity of foreign reserves that they have, and also by the willingness of people to hold that currency. And so the money supply in a fixed exchange rate regime is not gonna be determined by the central bank. It's gonna be determined by money demand, right? Because the central bank has committed to supplying as much money as people demand, and then buying that back if people demand less of it. So just like banks have to hold reserves of M0, those bank reserves that are accounts at the Fed, right? exactly like private banks do that, central banks with fixed exchange rates are going to have to hold foreign reserves. 
All right, so Hong Kong, for example, is going to have some amount of US dollars that it's going to have to hang on to in order to fulfill any potential promises that people come in and want to redeem. All right, if you want to come into the Hong Kong Central Bank and sell dollars to them, no problem, they can just issue Hong Kong dollars. But if you want to sell Hong Kong dollars to them and buy dollars back, they have to actually have those dollars. All right, so they're constrained by the amount of foreign reserves they have in exactly the same way as private banks are constrained by the amount of bank reserves that they have. Now, why would you do that? Why would a country bind themselves this way? It seems like a lot of trouble. And if you don't have to go to the trouble, well, why would you? Well, there's a few different pros to having a fixed exchange rate. Most importantly, you get decreased uncertainty about prices. Right? Imagine if you're a small open economy and most of what you consume is imported. Right? Suppose you're in Iceland. Not a lot of food grown in Iceland. So your grocery bill from day to day is going to be very dependent on the exchange rate. And if the exchange rate's bouncing all around, your grocery bill might be bouncing around from day to day or week to week. And it's going to be much less predictable what your cost of living expenses are going to be in a small economy where most of the consumption is imported. Same thing for exports. If you're in a business where most of your product gets exported, you're not going to want that uncertainty about how much money you're going to actually get selling that abroad. All right, so fixed exchange rates are a way of reducing that uncertainty. And when you reduce that uncertainty, both on the import side and the export side, this is going to increase the possibilities of trade. And especially for small open economies, trade is going to be really important. So anything you can do to encourage trade, that's going to be beneficial. That's going to help people to smooth out their consumption more and for things to be more predictable for them. Now, you can also imagine some of the cons. Right? Some of these are maybe a little more obvious. Right? First of all, you have to actually have the bank reserves in order to maintain a fixed exchange rate. And these are reserves that you could be spending on other things. Right? So you're just sitting on a pile of money, could be investing that, could be spending that, but you have to keep hold of it in case people come and try to redeem promises. So this is kind of a cookie jar situation for a lot of governments. There's this big pile of money sitting at the central bank that they're hanging on to just to fulfill potential promises. And if you're a government who's kind of running out of money, that might look kind of attractive. And you might want to put your hand in that cookie jar. And so if you fail to maintain these reserves, this can cause currency crises. And these are pretty frequent occurrences in countries where the government can't keep their hands out of that cookie jar. And finally, the last con is that because you're worried exclusively about the exchange rate, you can't do monetary policy in the usual sense, right? The volume of spending is going to be determined by people's demand to hold money. And you can expand and contract based on how much they demand to hold. And so ideally, you're not going to get huge shocks to the volume of spending. But if you do, Sometimes it's difficult to deal with those and maintain a fixed exchange rate at the same time. Now, here's what a fixed exchange rate looks like in practice. Right, this is the exchange rate between the Hong Kong dollar and the US dollar. And you can see some variation here. It's not perfectly flat, but notice the scale on the vertical axis. Right? These are very small fluctuations. Right, so this is fluctuating between about 12.87 and 12.9 cents. So it's not 100% perfect, but prices are not getting too far out of line before they hit that backstop. Right? If it gets too low, people will go to the central bank and buy or sell currency. Same thing if it gets too high and try to arbitrage that price difference away. Because if you can buy currency for 11 cents and the central bank's promising to buy it for 12 cents, right, you can arbitrage that. And that's going to cause that price to move back to what the central banks promised it to be. Same thing for if the price of currency is, let's say, 13 cents, and the central banks promised to sell it for 12. You can buy it from the central bank, sell it on the open market, and make that arbitrage profit. That's going to expand the money supply. That's going to cause depreciation and bring you back down to 12 cents. Right? So there's that backstop there. 
right? and prices are not going to get very far out of line before you hit that backstop of arbitrage. Now the second exchange rate regime that we're going to talk about is what's called a crawling peg. And a crawling peg you can think of as about halfway between a fixed and a floating exchange rate. So the central bank does care about the exchange rate, but it's also going to care about other things too. It's not going to make that fixed promise necessarily. So it's going to still have to hold foreign reserves because that's how it's going to be able to influence that exchange rate. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to do anything to influence that exchange rate. But it's not making any explicit promises either. So China, for example, these days does a crawling peg. Right? So it's going to smooth exchange rate fluctuations. It's not going to let the fluctuations get too big. But it's also no longer making any definite promises for a specific exchange rate. And this is what this looks like. Right? Prior to 2005, you can see that's essentially a fixed exchange rate. And you can see them smoothly kind of revalue, right? The exchange rate is falling. And so this is a revaluation. The renminbi is becoming more valuable. And so they kind of smooth this out. So it's not too fast of a fall. And this happens over the course of several years here. And you can see they settle on a new rate between 08 and 2010, and then let the exchange rate smoothly fall a little more, let the currency appreciate a little more. Now, the advantage of this is that you get some amount of stability, some amount of predictability, without some of the downsides. Right? You attenuate some of the upsides. Right? Things aren't quite as predictable as they would be under a strict fixed exchange rate, but you also don't have to do as much. And you also have some capability of doing monetary policy as well. And the final exchange rate regime we'll talk about is what's called a floating exchange rate. And in a floating exchange rate regime, the central bank is essentially saying, we're not going to worry at all about the exchange rate. We have other things to worry about. Maybe we'd rather do monetary policy instead. right? Because if you're using the quantity of money to affect the volume of spending, you can't use it to also set the exchange rate. Right? You can do one or the other, but not both. Now, this doesn't give the government infinite latitude. Right? The central bank still needs some amount of credibility in order for people to hold the currency at all. Right? If it hyperinflates, people are going to get rid of that currency, demand for currency is going to fall to nil, and you're going to get that kind of hyperinflation. So you need enough credibility for people to be willing to hold your currency at all. But beyond that, a floating exchange rate gives you lots of latitude in what you can do with the volume of spending for both good and bad purposes. And this is going to allow you to have both independent monetary policy and fiscal policy, or something we're going to call autonomous monetary policy. Right? So you can use the power to issue money to do things other than fix your exchange rate. Right? Because, if you, again, if you're fixing your exchange rate, that's other things you can't do with that tool. This is about what a floating exchange rate looks like. This is the exchange rate between the euro and the dollar. And you can see it kind of goes up and down and fluctuates and walks all over the place with no real pattern. As a matter of fact, this kind of graph has a statistical property that we'll call a random walk. And that's something we'll talk a little bit more about in intermediate. In a random walk, you can't predict at any point in time whether the exchange rate is going to go up or down. And we can talk about later in intermediate why exactly that would be the case. But for all intents and purposes, you can think of this as essentially random motion. So now that we've talked about these kinds of exchange rate regimes, I want to introduce a concept called the Mundell Trilemma. And the Mundell Trilemma gives you three goals of an exchange rate regime, three things that you might want your exchange rate regime to do. The first of these would be free capital flow. Free capital flow basically means the ability to buy and sell for an exchange. A fixed exchange rate would be the second one of these for the pros that we talked about earlier. And autonomous monetary policy would be the third. That would be the ability to use the money supply to alter the volume of spending. And the Mundell Trilemma says you can't have all three of these. You can only have two. You can pick any two, but whichever two you pick, you can't have the third. So in order to see why that would be the case, let's go into a little bit more detail about what each of these exactly means. First of all, free capital flow 
means that you can buy and sell foreign exchange without being restricted. Why would you be restricted? Because the ability to buy and sell foreign exchange is the counterpart to the ability to trade. And the ability to trade is what allows arbitrage differentials to be smoothed out. And very often, arbitrage opportunities throw a wrench in the plans of policymakers. And so they might want to limit that. And free capital flow also entails foreigners being able to make investments into the domestic currency, right? So both incoming and outcoming capital flows, right? That's what this would entail. And this has a lot of benefits, right? Despite the fact that policymakers might find this inconvenient sometimes for consumers and for efficiency, right? This is desirable for a few different reasons. First of all, remember when we talked about economic efficiency and the farmer who had to get a loan in order to purchase a farm that he could use more efficiently. Where does that financing come from? Well, in a big country like the US, there's lots of opportunities to come by that financing. Lots of funds available for you to undertake that project. If you're in a smaller country, or especially a poorer country, those funds are not gonna be available to you as readily. And you might have to pay very high interest rates in order to make that investment. And so economic efficiency is going to be hampered if all you can draw on is the funds available in your own home country, if you're in a very poor country. And so free capital flow, especially for poorer countries, is going to be really important for allowing innovations and investments to take place. Because right? otherwise, there's going to be much less possibility of resources flowing to their most valued uses. And that country is going to stay poor. Right? So free capital flow is really crucial. Right? It's not sufficient, but it's important for the possibility of economic growth in poorer countries. In addition to that, it's also going to expand opportunities for domestic citizens. It's going to allow them to import things, also to export things. It's going to allow them to take advantage of world markets, both on the incoming and outgoing side. And that's going to allow resources worldwide to flow to their most valued uses as well, and allow those resources to satisfy a lot more needs than they otherwise would. Now, the second piece of the Mundell trilemma, the second goal that you might want an exchange rate regime to have, is called autonomous monetary policy. And we've talked a lot about what exactly this entails already, especially in the last unit, but here I want to recontextualize that in the context of international macro. So autonomous monetary policy is the ability of the central bank to make the volume of spending whatever it needs to make it. So that's the ability of the Federal Reserve, for example, to increase or decrease M0 to be whatever it wants. And there's several reasons why a country might want this. First of all, it's going to insulate you from foreign shocks. Right? So if Hong Kong is pegged to the US dollar and the US cuts its money supply. Well, Hong Kong's also gonna have to cut its money supply and it might not wanna do that. As a matter of fact, this was a pretty big factor in the spread of the Great Depression throughout the world, is that a lot of these countries had fixed exchange rates with respect to each other because they were on the gold standard. And that shock in the money supply in one place kind of got transmitted everywhere else. So autonomous monetary policy lets you avoid that. And in addition to that, it also softens the government's budget constraint, which is to say that you can use the power to create money either to fix the exchange rate, to counteract recessions, or to generate senior revenue. Right? This is the same tool, and you can use it to do one of these three things. And if you're not using it to fix the exchange rate, you can do either one of the others. And you can imagine who might have an interest in either one of those, right? People might have an interest in being insulated from foreign shocks and the ability of the central bank to counteract recessions. Alternatively, the government might have an incentive to maximize its seniorage revenue. And either one of those, we're going to call autonomous monetary policy. Basically, the ability for the government to do whatever it wants with the money supply. And we've already talked about fixed exchange rates, what they are, what you might want to do with them. So that gives us our three corners of the Mundell trilemma. So here what I'm going to do 
is to take each leg of the triangle that corresponds to a choice of two and explain why you might choose those two as opposed to the other and who does it. So the first one we're going to look at here is the choice of free capital flow and a fixed exchange rate. So if you choose these two, you're rejecting autonomous monetary policy. You're giving up your ability to generate seniorage profit as well as your ability to adjust the volume of spending to counteract recessions. So who picks this? First of all, the Eurozone, right? The Eurozone, you can think of as kind of a super fixed exchange rate, right? We've said that, for example, the exchange rate between New York and South Dakota is one. Same thing in the Eurozone, the exchange rate between Germany and Greece is one, right? That's a fixed exchange rate because they have the same currency. But you don't have to be in a currency area to be here either. Right? Hong Kong also has a fixed exchange rate with the US. It has its own currency, but it's fixed against the US dollar. And they also have free capital flow. It's very easy to buy and sell Hong Kong dollars. So what is it about this choice that makes it impossible to also have autonomous monetary policy? Well, if you have a fixed exchange rate, and you allow people from throughout the world to take advantage of that promise and to buy and sell at the rate that you fixed, then the quantity of money is gonna be determined by the demand to hold it. And if you try to do autonomous monetary policy, if you try to expand the money supply, that's gonna decrease the exchange rate. All of a sudden you're promising 13 cents, but the current exchange rate is 12 cents. So people are gonna be buying up a lot of 12 cent currency and selling it back to you at 13 cents. And so all of that monetary expansion, you're just gonna to have to absorb that right back. The second leg of the triangle is gonna be fixed exchange rates and autonomous monetary policy. And if you're here, you can't have free capital flow. Well, first of all, who does this? Well, prior to Bretton Woods, most of the world, in fact, was under this arrangement. Bretton Woods was the post-World War II arrangement of the international monetary system. And you had most countries in the world on fixed exchange rates with the US dollar. But these exchange rates were not really corresponding with purchasing power parity. Right? And so governments had gotten really used to a lot of the flexibility that autonomous monetary policy had provided them, especially during World War II. Right, because they're relying on inflationary finance, they're relying on seniorage to finance the war. And if you want to go back to fixed exchange rates, you're going to have to step back on that. And a lot of these governments didn't want to do that. And so they gave up free capital flow in order to live on this leg of fixed exchange rates and autonomous monetary policy. Today, you also see this leg in a lot of fixed exchange rate regimes that are about to collapse. So Venezuela, for example, has spent a good bit of time here, right? Because it has autonomous monetary policy. You have that hyperinflation. It's trying to squeeze that seniorage profit out of the economy that way, but it's also trying to maintain a fixed exchange rate. And the only way to do that is to not allow free capital flow. Why not? Because if you have free capital flow, then any major difference in purchasing power parity is gonna get arbitraged away, right? So how do you prevent that from getting arbitraged away? Well, you just don't let people trade. And so if you prevent people from buying and selling your currency, then in principle, you can have the exchange rate be whatever you want. Right? How much good does that do you? Well, not a lot, because that's gonna really inhibit your ability to trade with the rest of the world as well. But notionally, or at least for politically connected insiders, right, this could be a great way of generating arbitrage profits. This is, for example, what a lot of cronies in Venezuela have done. Right? The exchange rate is so out of whack with the price level because of the hyperinflation that there's a big black market for currencies. And if you're the guy who's allowed to buy currency at the official rate and then sell it at the black market rate, right, you're making lots and lots of arbitrage profit there. And that's a way that sometimes corrupt regimes in hyperinflation situations reward their supporters. As a matter of fact, the U.S. kind of did this during the Great Depression too. Right? The U.S. banned private gold holdings. And gold, remember during this time, 
right? Because the U.S. was on a gold standard, gold was foreign reserves. So by banning private gold holdings, the U.S. is essentially saying no more free capital flow. So you weren't allowed to own gold except for jewelry for decades until the 70s. And the Federal Reserve wouldn't redeem gold to you or me, only to other central banks. So we as citizens in this case would be prevented from doing a lot of foreign investment, but there's also not a lot of opportunity for market forces to reassert themselves. And you don't get those forces that lead purchasing power parity to reassert itself. So the final leg is gonna be free capital flow and autonomous monetary policy. And in this case, most of the large developed countries in the world have an exchange rate regime like this. So the US now has this, England, Japan, the Eurozone as a whole, though not internally. And this is gonna allow you to do what you want with the money supply, but also to allow for an exchange. And if you have both of these, you can't have fixed exchange rates. Why not? Because if people are allowed to buy and sell currency, and if you're adjusting the volume of spending without regard to the exchange rate, then the exchange rate's gonna have to be whatever it is, right? So essentially you can control the price of currency or the quantity of currency, but not both, as long as you allow people to trade and arbitrage that away. So since the 1970s, the US moved from that bottom leg up to the top, and we gave up fixed exchange rates in exchange for free capital flow. So since the 1970s, international trade has really bloomed for this reason, right? Because we've removed a lot of the barriers to trade that were instituted after World War II in order to preserve those fixed exchange rates in the face of autonomous monetary policy, right? With floating exchange rates, we don't really have to worry about that. And so when Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard, right, the U.S. got a lot of inflation after that and then got it under control eventually. But the U.S. was also able to allow people in the U.S. to hold gold again. So for you and me, it's now legal to own quantities of gold in a way that it wasn't prior to the 1970s. So the cost-benefit calculus seems to be that for large economies, it's more beneficial to be able to control the volume of spending than it is to have the predictability of fixed exchange rates. Now, the way you can put this all together is you can think of the three legs this way. On the left here, you're allowing exchange, and so arbitrage can cause market forces to reassert themselves. And if you allow exchange, you can control the price, but not the quantity of money. All right, so the quantity of money is determined by the price, and so you can't do autonomous monetary policy. Over here on the right, if you're allowing exchange and you're controlling the quantity, you're doing autonomous monetary policy, you can't control the price and the price has got to do just whatever it's going to do. Down here on the bottom, you can disallow exchange and that's going to allow you to control both the quantity and the price, right? Because nobody's exchanging. That price doesn't really tell you anything. And in any case, this ends up being leaky in a lot of cases, right? The black market rate, the more incentive there is to take advantage of that, the more incentive there is to arbitrage that, the harder it's gonna to be to actually prevent free capital flow. And the more incentive people are gonna to have to go around that. Now, there are hybrid regimes too. You can hit the middle of the triangle if you're willing to go halfway on all three. China does this kind of, for example, this is its crawling peg, or sometimes you'll hear the word managed float. All right, so they don't make any promises about the exchange rate, it's not fixed, uh, but they also can kind of manage that trade-off between autonomous monetary policy and the fixed exchange rate. They can manage that on the fly. And they have even a little more flexibility on that because they also pretty severely restrict free capital flow. Right? If you're a US citizen, it's gonna be pretty hard for you or me to invest in Chinese stocks, for example. Now you can try to do all three. And as a matter of fact, lots of countries throughout the world and throughout history have been incentivized to try to do all three. But when you try to do that, bad things happen. And this is what we're gonna call a currency crisis. So here's Argentina at the end of 1991. It's trying to maintain a pegged exchange rate and it's trying to restrict capital flows and it tried to have autonomous monetary policy earlier. So it's had a lot of inflation 
without a lot of depreciation. And so in order to prevent people from arbitraging that, it's having to restrict free capital flow. But in the end, it becomes too difficult, right? It's not able to do that. And this promise that it's made for a fixed exchange rate, it's got to abandon that and devalue. And once it does that, the backstop is gone and purchasing power parity kind of reasserts itself. And the exchange rate's gonna move almost immediately such that purchasing power parity holds again. So in this case, it falls almost immediately from 10 cents a peso to seven and a half cents a peso. And you can see after that, it kind of starts floating from there. So let's talk about how these currency crises actually happen. All right, so in a fixed exchange rate, the central bank's making a promise to buy and sell any amount of foreign currency for a fixed amount of domestic currency and vice versa. Now, suppose that people get an inkling that that promise is not really trustworthy. So you as a holder of Argentinian currency, what are you gonna do? Well, you're gonna run to the central bank and try to turn all of your domestic money into dollars. And so if everybody does this, the central bank's gonna run out of reserves and it's gonna to have to break its promise. And this is exactly the same as a bank run, if you recall. Now, whereas a bank has to fail, the central bank doesn't really fail because it's part of the government, right? So what the central bank can do is break its promise in a way that a private bank really can't. So the central bank can say, well, we're just gonna give you new terms, right? Instead of promising for 10 cents, now we're gonna make a promise for seven and a half cents. And if it turns out we can't maintain that promise either, maybe we're gonna alter it further. So this gives us a sense of the importance of credibility to exchange rate regimes, right? And especially if you're gonna maintain a fixed exchange rate, it's gonna to have to be a credible promise. People are gonna to have to believe that the central bank is capable of keeping that promise. Right, now very often central banks and governments with a currency in crisis, they'll blame speculators. Right? And they'll say, oh, the speculators made this currency fail and we would have been fine except for the speculators, for whatever capricious reason, just decided to run on the bank. Right? Not really how it works. Right? So think about this from the perspective of a speculator or an investor. If you're betting on a currency going down and you go to the central bank and try to sell all of the domestic currency and buy foreign reserves, how are you gonna make money on that transaction? You're only gonna make money on that transaction if they're actually in trouble and if your expectation is warranted, right? So speculators don't make money just betting on things to fall, just for the heck of it, right? Speculators are only gonna make that bet and they're only gonna be able to make money on that bet if the central bank for whatever other reason is non-credible and if that expectation bears out in fact. So what kind of things determine whether a fixed exchange rate is credible? Well, there's a few different things you can look at. First of all, quantity of reserves is gonna be probably the most important thing, right? The central bank's gonna to have to have enough to cover day-to-day -day promises, just like a bank does. And if it doesn't have enough, then it's gonna be a pretty good bet that it's gonna to have to devalue at some point or another. Second factor would be past willingness. If a country gets into trouble and at the first sign of trouble, it says, well, nope, that's, uh, that's it for the fixed exchange rate. We're switching to autonomous monetary policy. Investors and speculators might be more reticent to believe them in the future. And this ended up being an important factor during the Great Depression, for example. Countries that had previously been more willing to go off the gold standard got hit harder. And then countries that had been more steadfast in the past were able to last longer. This is also kind of a factor in the Asian financial crisis. Right? In the early 90s, free capital flow was pretty new to a lot of these economies, and people had no idea if they would be willing or not to defend the peg. And in fact, the consensus was, you know, probably not. And so without that credibility built up, these countries got hit a lot harder. And the third factor would be low inflation, or especially aversion to inflation. So this was a major factor in, for example, Germany. 
Germany had hyperinflation prior to World War II, and everybody there said, well, that sucks, we're never doing that again. And so after World War II, Germany was kind of a paragon of good fiscal management. And when the Eurozone started to coalesce, the way this was done is that everybody pegged their currency to the Deutschmark. Because Germany had been able to maintain low inflation for so long, and had been committed to that so credibly, that they had the most credible currency in the whole Eurozone. Now for countries that aren't so credible, right? again, they'll very often blame speculators and say, well, this wouldn't have happened if not for the, the speculators and the rumor mongers and whatnot. And any time that currencies or stock markets or anything else runs into trouble, political leaders always want to invoke this logic of self-fulfilling crises and blame these speculators who are trying to, you know, maliciously undermine whatever goals the ruling party has. Here's China, for example, a few years ago had the biggest stock market crash ever. At its worst point, Billions of dollars of value a minute were being destroyed. Here's something from a few years ago about OPEC. OPEC tries to peg the price of oil. And of course, the speculators make that impossible, naturally. And here's the president of Turkey blaming speculators for the fall in the Turkish lira. You can see too in the second paragraph here that people are worried that he might try to compromise the central bank's independence. And so based on these actions, it looks like people might have kind of a good reason to be skittish about the lira. And this is probably a pretty good general principle. If you know who this guy is, this is a, a woodpecker. So here's a tip for when you buy a house. This guy's bad news if he's pecking on your rafters. Now, sometimes people will look at the woodpecker pecking on their house and chase it away and say, shoo, you're pecking holes in my house, I get lost. But what's he doing there? What's he after? Right? He's trying to get food for himself, and he doesn't eat wood. Right? The wood's not interesting to him. What he's interested in is bugs, right? and specifically the bugs that eat the wood. So if you see a woodpecker pecking holes in your house, right, don't get mad at him. He's telling you, you have termites. So if you want the woodpecker to go away, you got to get rid of the termites, which really you ought to do anyway. Same thing with speculators. If speculators are putting pressure on your asset or your currency, right, it's not very productive to blame the speculators. You've got to figure out why your promise isn't credible. Why don't they believe the promise? And that is going to be the root of the problem. So whenever you hear somebody blaming speculators for whatever crisis they're trying to manage, it's generally a pretty good bet that that person is probably more to blame for the crisis than the speculators. So let's run through a few ways that this might actually happen, a few ways that currency crises like this might get precipitated. So we've seen before that countries in bad fiscal situations very often try to monetize their debt. They try to get the central bank to print money to cover government debt and take advantage of that seniorage profit. And this is going to lead to inflation. Right? You expand the money supply to finance government spending, price level is going to have to go up. This is going to put them out of whack with purchasing power parity if they're trying to fix an exchange rate. And so what's happening here is that the government is indirectly spending away the central bank's foreign reserves until they run out. Right? If you're increasing the money supply, the currency is becoming less valuable. What you can do is you can buy that currency, sell it to the central bank, and the central bank has to give you foreign reserves, right? So you can see how the government expanding the money supply this way is essentially the same thing as putting its hands in the cookie jar and spending away those foreign reserves. And this is how inflation leads to currency crises, right? Once the central bank runs out of reserves to keep that fixed exchange rate, it's going to have to break that promise. So here's Argentina again, right? During this whole period of fixed exchange rates, the government's putting its hands in the cookie jar, trying to expand the money supply and finance government spending that way. So there's inflation, but there's not depreciation, right? So purchasing power parity is getting out of whack. So once the central bank runs out of those reserves, it has to devalue. It has to update the promise that it's made. And then after that, it might not even make a promise at all anymore. And in that case, you have a floating exchange rate. 
Something very similar happened to a lot of East Asian economies during the Asian financial crisis of the 90s. Right? So you get a loss of credibility in one country that kind of spreads. And people say, well, maybe if Thailand is that willing to abandon its peg, well, maybe Indonesia is as well. And so in that way, right, this credibility can be kind of contagious. And in the aftermath of that financial crisis, a lot of these central banks had been running pretty low reserve levels. And so since then, a lot of countries over there have been accumulating foreign reserves of the country that they've paid their exchange rate to. Right? So the more reserves you have, the more likely people are to believe your promise, and the less likely you're going to be to have a run on your currency or a currency crisis. Right? But this is costly. Right? This is money that these countries could be spending on consumption, but they're not. As a matter of fact, China has enough foreign reserves to buy back all of its currency and then more. Right? So they've accumulated so many reserves that there's essentially no possibility of a currency crisis in China at all. There's no situation where they would ever run out, no matter how much the demand for their currency fell. Now, let me give you the example of the Peruvian crisis as well in 1985. All right, so 1985, President Perez comes into power and says, hey, we're going to put the kibosh on all this previous high inflation, and we're going to institute a fixed exchange rate. And he does. But he fails to control government deficits. And so the government is still relying on seniorage and monetization to pay the bills. And so during this period of time, in the few years after 1985, the exchange rates stay in the same, inflation keeps rising, and you get divergence in purchasing power parity that's not being corrected. And whatever capital controls get put in are not very effective. And so eventually, Arbitrage causes purchasing power parity to reassert itself. The central bank has to devalue and move that promise more in line with what the price level actually is. That happens two years later, and then hyperinflation. And we can see this happening in a few different graphs here. And notice the log scale on the left-hand axis. Right, so this is going from 100, 1,000, 10,000, and increasing exponentially. And you can think of the blue line as the money supply and the red line as the exchange rate. So during this period of time, you can see the red line is flat, but the blue line keeps rising. Right? The government keeps printing money to cover its budget deficits. And so that gap keeps growing. And then there's one devaluation there, kind of buys time, closes the gap a little bit, but the gap keeps rising. And eventually there's a, another devaluation, it floats, and then we're off to the races and you get hyperinflation and the exchange rate from that point on is going to track the money supply pretty closely. You can see the same thing happening in terms of bank reserves and the budget surplus. All right, so once the fixed exchange rate gets instituted, you can see from that period of time a pretty steady decline in the foreign reserves available to the central bank, right? The government's indirectly spending those away with that gap between the money supply and the exchange rate. And you can see that gap down in this graph C. Right? The more the budget's in deficit, the more they have to print money to cover that deficit, and the quicker they're gonna be spending away those reserves. And you'll notice that once they stop making that promise, once the fixed exchange rate floats, right, the reserves stabilize. Right, because the government is now no longer indirectly spending those away because you don't have that divergence between purchasing power and the exchange rate. Now, what do you do once you're in a crisis? Well, there's a few different things you can do. The first thing you can do is to devalue. And when we talk about devaluation, this means that the central bank is altering the terms of its promise. We were promising 10 cents. Now we're promising 7.5 cents. And from now on, right, we're going to stick with that 7.5 cent promise. So we're going to maintain a fixed exchange rate, but at a different rate. Alternatively, if the central bank runs out of reserves completely, such that it's not able to maintain a promise at all anymore, or if the government's not able to get inflation under control, then the central bank might be forced to float the currency. 
And again, a floating currency isn't a promise to anything. So it says, hey, you know, we've kind of run out of reserves here. We're not making any promises anymore because we don't have enough reserves to back anything up. So why is this a bad thing anyway? Well, there's a few different effects that this has on the broader economy. First of all, this is gonna diminish the credibility of the government going forward. It's gonna make it harder for them to borrow, harder for them to finance any kind of emergency. And this is gonna deplete a country's fiscal resources. Right? This cookie jar that could have been spent, but that was being held on to for, let's say, a rainy day or an emergency, that's now no longer there. Right? That's been depleted. And so especially for poorer countries, they're going to get severely diminished investment in years following. Because investors at this point don't know whether they're going to be paid back in currency that's less valuable or get paid back at all. And so there's going to be less financing available for investment projects in poorer countries. And you can see in this graph over here that poorer countries get hit especially hard by currency crises because that financing dries up, right? Richer countries, you can finance things internally to some extent, but poorer countries, it's going to take a big hit until that credibility recovers enough for people to be willing to make those investments again. And growth is going to be lower for several years after that, especially in these poorer countries. So to sum up here, the lessons I want you to take away from this intro to international macro. First of all is that exchange rates are determined by the supply and demand for the foreign currency and by the supply and demand for domestic currency. Second, that purchasing power parity is going to be a good theory of major movements in exchange rates. But we're going to need something else for minor movements. And that's a active research program, and that's something that gets talked a lot more about if you're interested, if you take, for example, international finance. And finally, the Mundell Trilemma tells us that there are at least three possible goals of an exchange rate, but you can't have all three, right? There's trade-offs. And any two of those mean that you can't do the third without triggering a currency crisis. So that's it for this lecture and for this class. Thank you all for your attention. I hope you've gotten something out of it. And I'll be back in the next class. We'll go over homework four. And also be thinking about review questions. I'm gonna have you submit review questions for our last day of class. And then we'll all get together live via Blackboard Collaborate and do a review day, just like we did before the midterm. Thank you very much, and I'll see you then.